Hey, I'm Melissa with Pro Organizer Studio. I recently interviewed Laura Brown of the Sisters of Industry, and we talked about something that a lot of professional organizers find really scary, which is networking. We tried to demystify it a little for you and give you some ideas about how networking can be easy and fun and how you build something that we call the personal board of directors to make your business go to that next level. We would love to have you take a watch. Please subscribe and then comment below. I would love to hear your questions and answer your questions. And if you need anything else from me, you can find me every day on ProOrganizerStudio.com and on Instagram at ProOrganizerStudio. I'd love to get to know you. I am so immensely excited to be here today on the Pro Organizer Studio podcast with someone that I, well, I have a lot of names for this person, but be kind. I, I always, my favorite phrase for this person is she is my work bestie from one of my old companies. I have spoken on this podcast before many times about my corporate background. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is the importance of networking and having people. And Laura mm -hmm. is one of my people and one of my most important people in my whole life, but definitely in my career. So I would like to welcome Laura Brown to the podcast. Thank you for being here. So excited to be here and you're one of my people too. So I can't think of a better person I'd rather podcast with. Don't tell my usual podcast partner. I said that. Not. I will not. Laura, I'm going to let Laura introduce herself in just a second, but Laura has her own podcast and it's one that I recommend to everyone who is in business. It is called The Sisters of Industry and her podcast partner she refers to is her sister, her real life sister. Um, I'm her fake side sister, but her actual real life sister, they get together and they talk every single week about great topics about business and leadership and I highly encourage you to check it out. But Laura, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you do and all of that good stuff. So I'm one of those people that Melissa left behind in corporate world, right? I just, I can't get out, man. I don't know what to do. Just, and I say that jokingly, it. it's good for me. So I'm one of those people where the corporate crazy works and I have so much respect for what you all do in the entrepreneurial world. So I have been with the same company in corporate world for two decades. So for those Which of you looking at the camera, which is ridiculous. Know. Yeah. So it makes me a very weird person adds to the weird list. So I have 20 years um, with a company called Gladfelder that does heavy manufacturing. And so I am a woman in a manufacturing world. And my role currently is the vice president of sales and operations planning. So I get to do all sorts of cool stuff on a global scale coordinating between our operational folks and our sales folks, which means I always find myself in the middle of an argument just like at home with my kids. So I get to use the same skills everywhere I go every day. It's awesome. Mediation skills, whether at home or at work and now home and work are the same thing. So there you go. Absolutely. I can sometimes do a two for one. They don't, kids don't know. They think I'm yelling at them. I'm yelling at the screen. Everybody's taken care of. Amazing. Well, Laura and I met many, many, many years ago, and it's funny when she talks about, you know, being one of the only women in a manufacturing business, because mm -hmm. I tell the story occasionally when Laura and I met, um, I walked by a conference room and she was in there and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's another woman here. This is so exciting. And we were in industries where like, if you would go to a conference, usually the women's bathroom is lined up like seven miles back. But when you would go to conferences with us, women got right in, it was like no problem because there were so few of us. And now in the professional organizing world, world, it's exactly opposite. It's almost all women. Right, so right. And very, it's actually a, just a refreshing change. So it's nice to, I've, I've gotten both sides of the aisle on that one. So I know we're going to have to find the industry someday where men and women mix freely together in all yeah. sorts of love and harmony. Well, and then we won't know what to do. Right, exactly. <laughs> Well, one of the things that I wanted to bring you on um, to talk about is something that is very important. So as I introduced you as my work bestie, I, I have multiple work besties based on the companies I was with. So you were my work bestie at Glatfelter, and then I left to go to a different company, and my work bestie there was Ashley, and then I became a professional organizer, and I actually found a work bestie as a professional organizer, and it's someone who became a dear friend of mine and a business partner, Amber. And so I want to talk about how critical it is to have a person. 
Um, actually, right. we talked about multiple people, but um, in all seriousness, entrepreneurship sometimes can be super lonely. You feel like most of the people in our industry are solopreneurs. You know, we, we may be working alone. We may not have teams attached to us. Um, so you and I have been on each other's what we call personal board of directors for a long time. So do you Absolutely. want to talk a little bit about that concept and how important it is? Absolutely. So I think to me, you cannot beat having people that are your go-to people, right? And the first thing I'm just going to say is those people do not have to understand what you do every day. I think a lot of times we, I'm going to use a phrase that I use often, we assume ourselves into isolation. So we build up all these assumptions about why we think no one's going to understand me. They don't have the issues I have. They won't, I'll have to explain too much. It won't be worth the energy. But the reality is we are all challenged by things that come back to some core themes, right? We have decision fatigue. We're just exhausted of having to decide things all the time, right? We're struggling with our work-life balance. Whatever the case might be, there are themes that apply everywhere. So I think it's so important to take away all those assumptions that you've made that have you sitting alone thinking no one understands me. I am going at this alone. And right away, just recognize you're not alone. And there are people that are going to understand you. So let's go find them and get your own Avengers assembled or more professionally, get that board of personal advisors put together. And that board of personal advisors can be informal or formal, whatever works for you. The most important part is to do it and to do it in a way that is meaningful for you. So you keep at it. So you keep going with it, which is, I see people sometimes that get, you know, that they say like, okay, I'm going to have an accountability partner and that goes well for like two weeks and then it kind of peters out. And so right. having something that you will continue with. And I love what you said about, it does not have to be someone who knows exactly every intimate detail of your personal business. It could be that you just find someone else who is a solopreneur, or maybe you find someone like, obviously you and I have very different daily work lives, but they're really not that different. They're not <laughs> we that have different. a ton of the same challenges. And so finding that person, and sometimes it's finding people outside of your industry because they come at something with a totally different lens, I think. I actually think that's perfect. In fact, you really need three or four people that represent a whole lot of different points of views, right? Like, I love the fact that in my case, I'm lucky because I have a sister by blood who's part of my personal board of advisors. She's in a small organization kind of nonprofit setting. I have you, you're entrepreneurial. I have some others that are in a more um, corporate point of view, um, some that are international, some that are domestic. The point being, there's a lot of variety there because the reality is that variety forces us to approach things differently. Sometimes I'll talk to you, Melissa, and I'll realize, oh my gosh, I've, way, I've allowed the corporate over bureaucracy or overcomplicating to completely cloud up what I'm trying to deal with right now, wipe that away. And that ability to have an advisor who sees through that, boom, takes care of some things. On the flip side, sometimes I can go, hey, here's something that we structure because we are a corporation and it can be valuable for you as a small organization to find the same kind of structure because maybe it's legal protection or it's a place where process is going to help you work more efficiently, right? So I think we can learn so much from each other, even if we don't understand the actual details that we're working in on a day-to-day -day basis. That is so powerful because I do think as um, entrepreneurs, a lot of times we struggle with that idea of processes. We struggle with the idea of like, well, it's just us. So, you know, I don't have a director of operations. I don't have a VP of <laughs> HR. I, I have to call myself on my own HR violations. Um, but we have all of these people, we wear all of these hats, right? But that right. does not mean that you can't have the processes in place for your business. And one of the biggest things entrepreneurs really struggle with is time management of working on the business versus in the business. And I think someone like you with your background or anyone in a business could really give you some of those hallmarks, which I think is important. It is really important. I mean, that on versus in the business thing, we all go through that if you're in any level of leadership. I think about the fact you and I talk about it sometimes, right? We all manage it differently. I color code my calendar like a nut so that I can visualize this was strategic work. This was tactical work. This was just busy work. I even have a category for that, right? This is personnel work. Um, you have a cube. I can't think of the name of it, but I you have do. your cube that you flip. Um, I have it right here. You flip it. Right there. See, timular. See, that's, yes. I can't re ever remember that. But we, we have systems, right? But we're doing the same thing. We're trying to understand where we spend our time. 
It's the same thing. We do it differently. You get to do it in a fun, funky, entrepreneurial way. I do it in a boring corporate way, but the job is getting done um, so that we understand what each other are going through. And it's so funny because again, we often come back to the same theme. Oh my gosh, I worked 10 hours today and seven of them were going through issues that are going to do nothing to help me grow my business in the next two years. Right? So it, that, I think brings me to another point that helps drive you to honesty between each other too, right? Like really opening up about what's for real going on on the other side of your screen. Well, and I, I love that honesty concept because uh, this this uh, block, and uh, for those of you who are not watching this on YouTube, I'll show you a picture of, it is a cube that you flip to whatever you're working on. And I have been using it religiously. And sometimes I have found out, like last week is a great example. I found out that like, if you asked me, I worked on all the most important projects. And then when I got to the end of the week, I realized, oh, actually, I had two projects that I didn't do a single bit of work on, even though I was mm-hmm. tracking my Myself, even though I was paying attention to that. And um, you really can delude yourself into thinking you're working on the right things unless you are paying attention to it. And right. I got caught on it. This it talks about something else that we wanted to chat about today uh, by I have an accountability partner where every Monday and Friday we check in with each other. We're working on a very specific project together. And uh, on Monday and Friday, we send each other like uh, uh, goals and then what we accomplished. And I had to fess up to her, to your point about honesty. I had to fess up. Guess what? I didn't get my stuff done this week. And she very lovingly said, no, no meanness intended here, but why didn't you get it done? And I said, because I was working on the, the urgent versus the Not important. the important. Mm -hmm. which is so good. So I think you just hit on a second one too, right? So whether it's an individual who's your work bestie or this board of advisors, whatever concept you're using, you have to be honest with them and they have to be willing to give you the tough love back. And there needs to be a no hard feelings, no repercussions. It's two way street going on there because if you're honest and bear all and they do the nice, well, you really tried. So thanks for coming. You've got nowhere. In fact, you're being enabled in that situation, yes. right? Like that's not good. You need to have somebody who's kind of, who's willing to say, time out. Um, I'll offer an example. Like my sister and I work in extremely different worlds, but by virtue of doing a podcast, we also spend some time every Friday just talking to one another before we start. And a couple of weeks ago, she was struggling with a particular decision. And I'll admit, I was a little mean to her in retrospect. I probably owe her an apology, but I kind of said, what's so hard about this decision? Why is this decision so hard? Well, well, well. And like, you need somebody who's going to say, what's so hard? What do you know? What don't you know? In, a, in the case of decision making, what additional information do you expect to get? Is there any reason why there's continued debate here, right? You need someone who's going to probe and ask you questions like that. And again, I don't know anything about what my sister does at work, and she doesn't know anything about what I do at work. And I surely don't know anything about what you do at work, Melissa, even though you've taught me how to fold my shirts properly. And you've tried very hard to get me to get my own um, LLC set up correctly. So you know, there's a lot there I need to learn. There's a lot there I need to learn from you. But the reality is there's so much applicable discussion just to hold each other accountable. Yeah. Well, and that that honesty and that asking each other the hard questions. So a little bit of tough love. Uh, and, it, and that may hurt in that moment. But the important thing is it's driving you forward. And no one loves right. to hear not great feedback, right? Like none of us love to hear like, hey, here are 10 things that I think maybe aren't quite going your way. But it's so important to drive you forward and finding someone from whom you will accept that graciously and mm-hmm. and understand that they are just trying to make you better. And like you said to your sister, what's so hard about this? Sometimes we vastly overcomplicate things. And I will say professional organizers, because a lot of professional organizers are very, very regimented, which is beautiful in their job. Sometimes that thinking causes people not to be able to make a decision. So having that person to be like, why is this decision hard? Just go make an LLC. Just call yourself XYZ business. Just go post something on social media. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, I promise you, you're overthinking it. You really are. Right, right. There's no doubt about it. I even have a little sign 
behind me that reminds me jokingly that actually says, hold on, let me go overthink this. And I yes. look at it jokingly <laughs> all the time because we, we yes. all tend to be overthinkers. Let's be honest, as women, we really lean into overthinking. It's like our specialty. Yeah. Um, so, which is why I like making sure I have some men on my board of advisors too, because let's just be honest, another perspective that we may not always like, but it's so helpful. That is a great point to have a group of people that not only maybe outside your industry or have different perspectives, but bring different perspectives from the table um, from a gender perspective. Super yeah, and it can be gender, it can be cultural, whatever the case might be, putting some level of diversity in there, it really does make a big difference, I think. Yeah. Um, so accountability, so part of this personal board of directors is that concept of holding someone else accountable. In our Inspired Organizer program, we match people up with accountability partners so that they have people who can be, you know, can kind of start that right. personal board of directors. But if someone doesn't really have anybody, do you, I know that this is sometimes a word that stresses people out and you actually have a whole podcast about it, but it's the word networking. No. <laughs> now networking, people get really stressed out, I think, by networking because they think that they're going to be at some sort of event where they're going to have like bad small talk with people and it's going to be stressful and it's going to be awkward and all of these things. But networking can be a lot it's a broad encompassing term. So can you tell us a little bit about networking and your view of it? And then we can talk a little bit about networking groups that we know about too. Sure. So networking, I, I will definitely admit it's one of those things like I, my stomach balls up a little bit. I kind of want to throw up to think about networking. There are probably name tags involved and really bad cocktails that I do not want. So it is not something I get excited about on the surface. But I think one of the realizations I've had in the last couple of years is that networking has inappropriately gotten a bad name. Yeah. There really is so much value and networking does not have to be that worst case scenario that we all just conjured up in our mind. You can network by doing something as simple as having two or three people that you have an online connection to and saying, hey, would you guys be game for a FaceTime call once a week where the three of us can discuss some of the things that are giving us a challenge this week, um, maybe offer each other some encouragement. It can be that informal and that easy, really, to be honest, right? I think the most important thing you want to do is think, what do I want to get from a network I'm trying to establish, right? Do I want to get really solid industry professional advice? Then you might want to find an established thing. Like I, I'm a supply chain professional by trade. So the Apex organization that is one that specifically networks and works in supply chain, it's worth it because while it might have some of that awkwardness we make fun of, these are supply chain professionals. They're going to talk about dorky things like how trucks move across the global network that there's like six of us that think that's cool, right? Um, that's going to happen there. On the other hand, I would say if you're looking for encouragement and people to just help you think differently, for heaven's sakes, a book club might do it for you. You might want to say, find five people and say, let's read Atomic Habits, intentional book reference there. I know you and I both okay. love that book, right? Let's pick a book and read this book together and discuss it. And you can find, you start to build connections that way. It does not have to be the ick, icky, yucky thing that we all think networking is. You can approach it from so many different angles. The key is that you actually do it and make the hard step of saying, hey, want to talk. Because I think what I like to remind myself is that I'm not the only one that feels lonely and is out there looking for a network. The reality is you're probably going to ask somebody who is thinking the same thing and maybe is personally struggling to start on their own. And they're going to be so thankful for you asking. Worst case scenario that you've conjured up in your mind that they're going to slap me and tell me that I have nothing possible to give to them and why would they want to talk? This is not going to happen, people. So go ahead and wipe that from your mind. And even if that did happen, what's the worst thing about that that happens? You never see them or talk to them again. You move on, right? The important thing is to actually go for it because everybody needs it. And even if they already have one, they might invite you into their network and it'll be an awesome ready-made thing to go. Just do it. Just do it. One of the things that you talked about on your podcast on this issue was, um, and I, I wrote it down because I loved it, it was your intention versus it being an obligation. So intent versus mm -hmm. obligation. And, you know, if you feel like you're just going to an XYZ networking event because you have to check a box or you have to do it, but your heart isn't in it, that is not going to be a great networking event for you. And it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're like, well, networking doesn't work because you're not putting the effort right. into it. 
Right. So it doesn't have to be a formal group to your point. It can be an informal group. And for professional organizers, your network can be other moms that you're in a group with, or it could be a book club like you're talking about because you just happen to talk about what we do for a living. People find what we do for a living very interesting. So that network can be a very amorphous thing. It does not have to be a formal chamber of commerce, for instance. Oh, please no, because that's probably... <laughs> No, we won't go there, should we? I shouldn't go there. Chambers of uh, Congress, chambers. I can't even say the plural of that. Pluralize that for me. I'm lost already. There you go. Thank you, darling, my grammar friends. I, that can be a wonderful thing, right? You're probably not going to yes. do great networking there to help what you're trying to achieve. So be clear about what you want to do. Be intentional about it. And the other thing that I like to point out and make it easy. Do not put yourself in a position where it's, on a Monday night at six o'clock and you just can never get out of the office. That would be in the days we went to an office maybe, but you know, whatever the case might be, don't make it hard for yourself to do it either. Make it easy. That is consistent with James Clear's third role in Atomic Habits, right? When, when he talks about habit building, I've already mentioned that book twice. It tells you how great it is, right? Um, you, you know, it. it's amazing. make it easy either a convenient location, maybe it's on Zoom so you can go in your pajama pants, whatever the case might be, maybe there's child be care because you're at a stage of your life where you need that. I actually know of a couple of women, and this would be a non-COVID statement, that were meeting at the Cafe Nosh, which is what the little cafe in my gym is called. They were meeting there because they could use the gym's childcare because that was important to them there. Oh, Fine. sure. Find ways to make it easy to get with this group too, because if you're distracted by the act of getting there and then it's not even where you really want to be, it's a worthless pursuit. There are so many options now too because of COVID for organizations that have been in-person networking, which may feel a lot more, um, it just may feel a little bit more unwieldy or scary or whatever word you want to mm -hmm. use. Now there are so many online options too. Like all of the networking groups that I know of that are more national, for instance, like BNI, things like that, they're all virtual now, which is a great way to kind of get your feet wet and say- is Right, this right, like? right, right. And finding Finding a group of people that really fit with you too. Like not every group is probably going to be the right fit. You know, maybe a chamber group, one chamber group in one town is great and a chamber group in the other town is, is not your jam. That's, that's probably going to happen. But trying these groups out to find your people um, is never a waste of time. It isn't. And I think there's also... <laughs> A thousand years ago when Melissa and I were college age, right? You talked about the shotgun strategy of marketing, like shotgun, just put a million things out there. Apply the same concept here, right? Um, yes. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Let's see, see how many little trite phrases I can use in two minutes time. Don't put everything in one direction. Maybe you get four or five people on that board of directors because somebody's going to leave at some point. There's going to be something, maybe they relocate, maybe they just decide that they would like to change the course of their professional or personal life, whatever the case might be, things are going to rotate. Do not expect this to be a lifelong commitment and don't place that expectation on someone else. Honor it for what it is now. Take everything that you can from it. Give everything you can to it and allow room for it to change over time. And I think actually that becomes an even greater blessing because I'll use us as an example, right? We started as work besties. Now we're on a personally chosen board of advisors and we're each other's people as well, just in both work life and play, right? So it's beautiful to watch those things evolve over time. I just think finding that person, so whether it's it's one person, like I said at the beginning, I've kind of had one person that I go as my top go-to person at, at the places that I have worked, but finding those people to just commiserate with, to laugh with, to cry with, to right. be frustrated with, to be happy with, to cheer on, it makes the journey of entrepreneurship just infinitely less lonely. And I know you have loneliness in your job because you are a leader mm -hmm. and sometimes that can be lonely, but to your earlier point, we all feel loneliness in different ways and having those people that you can go to right. and just understand, or they just listen and let you vent and say, thank you for coming to my TED talk and then move <laughs> on. <laughs> you know? And being vulnerable with someone, this is a key part of any of these relationships we're talking about, whether it's an accountability partner, a board of directors, your person, being vulnerable with that person and saying, hey, I'm struggling and I need your help with something, whether it's business or personal right. or whatever, um, that makes the relationship all that much richer. 
It does. And I think it also, it gives you a place to take your emotions and use them safely because one of the most difficult lessons I've had to learn in business over my career is how to manage my emotions. And I know sometimes, particularly as women, you and I are both women. I know a fair number of our listeners will be women for this podcast, right? We get branded a lot with being emotional and it can make us angry that we get branded that way. When I was finally willing to own that as part of my reality and learn how to constructively direct those emotions, it genuinely game changed my career. Um, And I remember being angry to our point earlier about sometimes you're upset when you get a message from somebody. I was angry with the first person who was brutally honest with me about that being something that was impacting my career. But now I have this very thoughtful approach that says, I'm going to have days that infuriate me. And I need to, whether it's the text stream with my unofficial board of advisors, or it's the one-on-one mentee-mentor relationship that I have formally, wherever I'm going with that, I need to find the right place to channel those emotions. Because you also, as a leader, have this very fine line of needing to be the stalwart leader um, without overplaying your emotions, but you still need to be able to be a little bit vulnerable. So having folks that help you learn to navigate that, I think is huge, because I don't think any of us are doing ourselves a favor if we think either we have it under control or that we want to deny that that issue really exists. P.S. Men have that issue too. It just manifests differently, right? It just completely manifests differently and is perceived differently. But at some point we have to acknowledge it, own it and deal with it. And I've found that to be game changing too, to know my extreme emotions need to go somewhere else. And I manage the middle publicly at work. And that's made a huge difference. Uh, I totally agree with that. I am also a person who lets emotions rule the day and it's very hard. It's very, very hard, especially the older we get to change that. But (laughs) one of the things um, our founder, Jen Obermeyer, has a workshop out right now. And one of the things she talks about in there, which is super impactful, is you have to show up for your client and let Mm -hmm. nothing bother you. You have to be coaching your client and whatever you have going on, you have to be present for them. These people that we're talking about, your people behind the scenes are the ones that then you can take that frustration or, uh, and sometimes it's frustration with a client session and take it back to those people, but not reflect it out. And that's your version of not reflecting it on the job. You can reflect that and use it for, use it for good rather than evil, I guess. So, right. And it spares your spouse. It spares your spouse or your significant other who might get way too much of it. I can't tell you how often I look at my husband and go, I'm going to tell you the six things I'm angry about before I get on this conference call. So I don't say them when I get on this call and the fear that casts over his face is overwhelming. Right. So find a constructive place to proactively manage those things and spare the ones living in your immediate proximity that hear way too much of it. Every once in a while, like Tim can tell that I, you know, some maybe something frustrating happened, and he'll be like, uh, "Do you want to talk about it?" And I'll just be like, "No, I'm gonna spare you. <laughs> like, you don't even want to know. Just forget it." So, um, a, since we're on the book train, Laura and I are, are book people in our private lives. We love books. Um, and another book on this subject, which I recommend to people, is Emotional Agility. And I can't yeah, the author's good name one. right now, but I know I could probably stand for a reread of that one because it's it's definitely definitely a good one. Um, so networking groups, there are actual networking groups, and I'm going to put in the show notes some of them that I know about. But um, just thinking about things, there are national groups, there are local groups to you, and there are virtual groups. So if you are listening to this podcast and saying, you know what, I'm ready to like, I'm ready to be bold and go start networking. There are so many options for you. And I asked our inspired organizer community yesterday when we were preparing for this, you know, what are some groups that they loved? And I will put all those in the show notes, but BNI, which is Business Networking International, I know a lot of professional organizers really love that. One of the things about that group is you can only, there can only be one person in a specific industry in a local group. So you're not going to get 12 other professional organizers. So that's a group that a lot of people love. In our uh, industry, obviously NAPO, is uh, we have national NAPO and then you have local NAPO chapters. A lot of people really like that. Um, There are also women's based networking groups including Polka Dot Powerhouse. Uh, Tuesday Morning was one that people really liked. I was involved for a while in one called Pepper Lane. All of these are virtual right now. So you might wanna go check them out and 
you know, you might find someone. I have someone locally that I have connected with who's in that same, she's on my board of directors and um, she's in a very different industry. She's a stylist, but we met at this Pepper Lane meeting and we have become such good friends and, and business, you know, buddies. And it's just, had I not gone to that meeting, had I, I had not stretched myself, I would never have met her, so just nice to have those options. One of the things that I really encourage people to do, and we've talked about it, we've touched on it a few times during this podcast, but using your network, using your accountability partners to actually give you super good feedback. And we've talked a little bit about the feedback loop, but again, bringing it back to what we do in our, or in our organizing world, mm -hmm. your accountability partners, your network group can be the people that you say, I need you to take a hard look at my website. <laughs> and sometimes we get so close to the work that we're doing because we're alone that we tend to say like, okay, this is my thing. And, and I can't see it. It's the, you can't see the forest from the trees. And so giving those accountability partners in your network, something to do and say, I really want your feedback yes. on. Yes how I come across on my website or how I come across on a video call or how I present myself when I'm speaking, any of those things, like really using that group for constructive feedback on that, which is just going to make you better for showing up to your clients. I think that's really important. And you know what I'd add to that, Melissa? Sometimes it's important to let people know what you're looking for when you put that stuff yes. out there. Like sometimes it is, guys, beat this up. Let me know. I want the feedback. And it's only fair to also say, hey, sometimes I'm so proud of this, only positive yes. feedback welcome, right? Like right. at least just own it, at least own right. how you're coming to the table about the conversation. I actually have a lot of respect for people that do that. I'm not gonna waste my time editing it. If you're telling me all you want is for me to be able to say, that is amazing, good job. And that's okay, that yeah. is totally okay. But I think a really good way to use your network well is to also let them know what you're expecting from them at any given moment. I mean, I know sometimes I will text even you or others in, in the group that we use and say, you know, hey, I'm so excited about this, be excited with me. And you might be on the other end going, she be psycho, that is not good. But I was looking for your happy, now is not the time. We will find the time to say, Laura, this may not have been the best decision of your life, right? But I think it's really good to allow people to know what you're looking for um, and to give them the okay to give you constructive feedback. Sometimes people need to know they're off the leash. Absolutely. I have an actual live example using you of this that happened a few weeks ago. I had designed this page for something and I sent it to you on my group, my girl boss group text. And all three of you came back, you're like, hey, look, I don't mean to like throw a wet blanket, but you like this link doesn't work or this, it doesn't look good on mobile or whatever. But that was, I needed that feedback because I guess what I hadn't looked at it on mobile. And guess what? It looked bad on mobile. You guys saved me from a bad result, even though I had said like, hey, praise me for this beautiful thing. You guys also <laughs> knew that that was a good time to be able to tell me it is beautiful. Just one more thing. <laughs> and that, yeah. that's the importance of relationship. And that's that trust. That's vulnerability. That is all of the things that we have talked about. So find your people. It will benefit you in so, so many ways. Right. And the only final thing I'll add, and this is the same advice I give to my kids when it's about friendships you get out of things what you put into them, right? And I think um, we have to be clear about that. If you approach the topic of networking all about what you want and what you need, you're gonna also struggle. So go find those people. And the best way to do that is go be somebody's person. I love that. There is no better place to end this podcast. Thank you so much. I am so happy that you were my person. And I hope that our people on this podcast go find their people after this. And that's a lot of peoples in one sentence. This has been fun, Melissa. Thanks so much for having me. So tell us just really quickly, where can people find you on the great wide interwebs? Um, so in the professional manner or the unprofessional? Just kidding. As Melissa mentioned earlier, I do have a podcast that I do with my sister. It's called The Sisters of Industry. It's available on all the major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Google, et cetera. Um, the Sisters of Industry. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram under the same. And at, on our website, um, thesistersofindustry.com. See, there's a theme here. Um, there's all sorts of contact forms and information if you ever wanted to get a hold of Jen or I for our unique perspectives on what you might be dealing with in business. But we love to talk to folks. Um, I appreciate the chance to have been on this podcast. It's so fun to podcast with other podcasters because we know what each other are up to. 
And um, if any of you would like to join us, we'd be happy to welcome you. In addition to this lovely family you find yourself in with Melissa and Jen, we'd be welcome, happy to welcome you to our podcast family that is also co-hosted by a Jen, in my case. Jen adjacent. I love it. Yes, Jen podcast adjacent ever. podcasting. Both Jens in South Carolina, no less. So oh, I forgot about that. South Carolina. Yes. So, well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it very Thanks much. And we will see you on the internet.